Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome back to Watches Tonight here at Watchbox Studios. We have a great agenda for the evening. We talk about selling a Rolex GMT Batman, regrettable industry mistakes of 2018 to date, speculation about a Longa sports watch, and the best article of the week. I've thrown a little bit more in there, but you get the idea. Today, I want to emphasize that there is no better place to buy, trade, or sell a watch than thewatchbox.com. I'm not going to beat it to death, but they pay for these pixels. You can see my videos, and we have over 1,700 pre-owned luxury and vintage timepieces, live 24 hours a day. We're in Switzerland, we're in Hong Kong, we're in Philadelphia, and growing. That's thewatchbox.com. Okay, tonight we're giving away a Breitling Colt Sky Racer, so make sure to check the link below in the description. $2,000 retail value, it's a chronometer. 100 meters water resistant, bright light composite case, and one of the most wearable do it all sports watches you're gonna find. Brightling Colt Sky Racer, I'm finally giving time to you. Okay, tonight, batting practice, warming up my monitor and yours with your pitches and my cuts. First, Jasper N asks Tim, if I were to give you $5,000 and prohibit JLC, what would you buy? Okay, well, you know how I do, I like pre owned. You get true value, and in my opinion, there's more interesting stuff out there. So I'd start with, for five grand, Gerald Genta Arena Sport. Made during the mid-2000s, this was very cool. Jump Hour Retrograde Minute. Now, this one's about 41.5 millimeters. You could pick it up for about four grand. That's a heck of a lot of distinctive design, as well as a fun and practical complication. Is it fun? Is it fabulous? Is it fatuous? Sure, but at the end of the day, it tells time and does it with a smile. So that'd be my first choice for about four grand. Uh, Zenith Rainbow, the real Zenith Rainbow flyback caliber 405 from the 90s and early 2000s. This is now a vintage watch. Tritium dial, old school, rarely built, and incredibly, this was built to a French military aviation contract during the 90s. One of the last honest-to-God mechanical watches to be delivered on a true armed forces contract. 40 millimeters in steel, it's a great-looking piece, and it's a flyback. So the watch that I would add to my Zenith Pilot's watch would be an Omega Mars watch. So the Omega X33 Generation 2, this is the one made from about 2001 to 2006 for the civilian market. An absolute Swiss Army knife for your wrist. Smaller than it looks, full titanium and 42 millimeters. This is already a classic and a watch I adore. Plus, at about 2,500 to three grand, depending on whether you get it on the strap or the bracelet, it's a screaming deal. And you guys know this is my great unfinished business. I should have bought this thing for 600 bucks at the military purchase program price when I was in the service. I didn't. I still regret it. Grand Seiko SBGH051. This is about as scarce as it gets. 35 pieces for the U.S. Grand Seiko boutiques. A beautiful watch with a high beat movement, gorgeous blue dial, rich, glossy, and lacquered. A combination of silver, gold, and blue tones. That's a handsome piece and an absolute do-it-all everyday go-to. I would love to own that watch, and five grand will just about pick one up. Okay, Karsten P. asks, Tim, I'm thinking of trading my Rolex GMT Master II Batman. Okay. This is an interesting one. He wants to get rid of the most desirable Rolex of the moment. First, let me quickly call out some of our friends. Mozart Reville, I can see Eddie Landsberg, Amadigi, PY7, Kyle K, Carlos Don Gizzle from Germany. I am Charlie. Welcome, guys. Welcome aboard. So we're selling a Rolex GMT Batman, and we're buying something else. Why is that? Well, Carson says, I like but don't love the watch, and it seems like the time to sell is now. There seems to be an irrational exuberance surrounding this watch. Whatever replaces it, I want value retention. I want an off-the-beaten-path maker model. Uh, no smaller than 40, no larger than 45. Tim, what are my options? Okay. Well, I realize you're going to net about 8000 to 9000 if you wholesale this to a pre-owned dealer. If you sell it privately, you're probably going to get about uh, ten to 11000 maybe eleven to twelve, depending on how badly the private buyer wants it. So that's what we're working with, somewhere between eight grand and let's say eleven. So what can we buy there? Well, we're going pre-owned because you're moving from a rock-solid store of value with the Batman, so I don't want you to lose money on whatever you buy with that cash. So, short of buying another Rolex, let's go with a pre-owned watch, and we should buy a replacement with, in my opinion, at least a little bit of a sporting bent, not a pure dress watch. So... My first question would be, what don't you like about your Rolex GMT? Clearly, it's not size, because you say you're still down for a 40-millimeter watch. Appearance, brand image, or functions 
let's take it one by one. First, if you don't like the appearance of a Rolex GMT, steer clear of almost every other conventional sports watch because they're all Rolex clones, and that includes other Rolex models. So let's talk about something that's sporty but not a classical sports watch. Bulgari Octo Finissimo Automatic is right up your alley. 40 millimeter size, ultra thin, 5.15 millimeters thick, and it has a movement that's two and a quarter millimeters thick. This is a GPHG awardee, so it has an impressive palmares, as they would say, in cycling. It has a trophy case. This is about as far from a Rolex GMT as you can get without buying something way out of the mainstream. 40 millimeters titanium. There is a steel version available now, but we're looking pre-owned, um, and the steel is brand new. Manufacturer caliber BVL138, 60-hour power reserve micro rotor automatic, and a real-world 30-meter water resistance. This is not a delicate watch. This is 60s Piaget. Moreover, Nine to about nine and a half thousand gets you the titanium watch on a strap. I recommend spending the full 11 grand you're going to net from a private sale of the GMT to get the watch on a full titanium bracelet. The bracelet is exquisite, thin, comfortable. It's like a second skin. Get full value, get it on a bracelet, spend the full 11, you won't regret it. Remember, 11 is still pretty close to what that watch sells for. It's 13.9 new. It's only dropped to 11 pre owned. There's a lot of momentum behind the new Bulgari Octos. And this is really the flagship of the line from a collector enthusiasm standpoint. Now, if you're shying away from Rolex brand image, let's take the next rejection factor that we might be considering here from Karsten. If you're trying to shy away from the wrist checks, the brand image baggage, the unwanted scrutiny that comes with Rolex ownership, you might find a brand that falls far beyond the mainstream of luxury status symbols is to your liking. Well, a billion dollar company, but a relatively obscure brand still in the United States, and even in Europe, the Karl F. Bucher Petravi Scuba Tech is a diver that's within your size bracket, 44.6, but it wears more compact. came out in 2013, and you do get value here. Bracelet, screwed in, not held in by spring bars, extensible clasp and a push-button slider, COSC chronometer, ceramic bezel, 500-meter water resistance, helium escape valve, and absolutely volcanic loom. This is a watch that puts it all together. And $6,800 new, you're going to pick it up for around 4,000 pre-owned, 3,800 to 4,000 pre-owned on the bracelet. That's a lot of watch for the money. And if you're not ready to spend all of your returns on the GMT, that lets you really keep your options open. You could save that money and build up to a second watch alongside this one. Buy it pre-owned at four grand, you're not going to lose and you're going to get a hell of a diver in lieu of your, your GMT without going sea dweller or submariner way underrated watch okay now if you're not really a gmt dual time kind of guy maybe you want to consider something like a chronograph and a watch that has a mechanical angle so this is a horological connoisseur's watch, a movement guy's watch. Consider the Defi El Primero 21 in titanium, 44 millimeters, a foudroyant that is a 1 100th of a second register. It's absolutely spectacular. Two mainspring barrels, two escapements, two power reserves. Now, a couple of different ways to get this watch. I will say 100 meters water resistant. You're going to pay about 8.5 to 10 with titanium and the open dial. You're going to pay about 11 to get that watch, open dial tie, on a bracelet. But I would say go with the closed dial because it's by far the least common. It's got a gorgeous and classical panda dial that I think will age better than the open dials that seem to be a corporate theology right now at Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy across Zenith, Hublot, and Tag. This is the one that doesn't look like all the rest, and that's the one I would choose. It's also the least expensive to buy pre-owned, so that's my choice. Okay. Guys, chime in, by the way. I will be reading out of the chat box tonight. I try to interact as much as possible. Um, of course, you want to remind me as we go through your opinions on my picks. I do value your feedback. And even if I don't read your comments out loud in the broadcast, I always read them in full after, so you won't be unnoticed. Okay, Theo R asks, Tim, is the oversized watch trend ending? I feel like there's been a turn away from oversized watches, but I can't quantify or support the opinion broadly. What do you think? I think you have to go with your gut there, Theo. There has been a move away from grossly oversized watches in general. It's true in in some ways, uh, the current size trend I would call a bit of a melding, a meeting in the middle between traditional sizes and truly monstrous 2000 style 
you know, 47 to 50 millimeter cases. First, here's an ideal example. The 1990s IWC Pilot's Watch Mark 12 was about 37 and a half millimeters. The 2012 Mark 17 was 41 millimeters, and the 2016 Mark 18 settled on 40, with a little bit of a less bombastic single date a more restrained dial. So we're meeting in the middle. Again, something like a Patek Philippe World Time 5110, that would have been 37 millimeters. The 5130 that followed was 39.5, and now the 5230 is 38.5. There's a lot of meeting in the middle right now. That said, I will concede that JLC Panerai and even Omega with its burly Seamaster Planet Oceans have stepped back and started offering mid-size options and unisex options in recent years. So they're definitely pulling back from the exuberance of the 2010s, or as many like to call it, the decade from hell. But I will say more than a reduction of existing uh, models and size, we're just not seeing the same kind of watches launched. So the natural forces of attrition are kind of claiming the old guard of the truly oversized and monstrous, and they're not being replaced. We're not seeing the kind of watches that launched at the peak of the oversized trends during the 2000s, and existing nameplates being phased out. Consider Rolex hit its all-time peak in 2007, and then 2008 with the 44 millimeter Yachtmaster 2, and then the truly monstrous 44 millimeter, nearly 18 millimeter thick deep sea the next year. JLC gave us its ungainly 47 millimeter master compressor extremes. We haven't really seen any watches like that. I think we've got some graphics of these, but we haven't really seen any watches like that from JLC since. And the Polaris collection that came, there it is, the Polaris collection that came after that is basically 41 and 42 millimeter sports watches. And that's what a JLC sports watch is today. This is the big boy of the collection at 44, and I can tell you it doesn't wear a master compressor extreme 44. It wears more like a 42, and it's titanium. Finally, remember that Audemars Piguet hasn't revisited its 48 millimeter Royal Oak offshore in a good long while, and its evil twin, the absurdly named Hublot King Power, has been MIA for quite a while. Vert your eyes. Okay, so I do think there is a step back. Dress watches, sports watches, you're going to see something like 38 to 40 being the new dress watch size, 40 to 42 being the new norm for sports watches. I don't think we're ever going to get back up to 46, 47, 50 as a normal standard offering. So there has been a little bit of a pullback, and I think that's a good thing. Okay, Enrico S. asks, what has been the biggest watch industry mistake of 2018 so far? Was it product, person, marketing campaign, or strategy, or any of the above? Okay, Enrico, good question. I did my best and worst of 2018 so far, but we can definitely pull some highlights and maybe revisit some that deserved to be mentioned but weren't. Okay, first, the easy ones. Balm. Not Balm and Mercier, but Balm. Two down market with prices between a few hundred and about eleven $1 hundred dollars. Too weird. Too vulnerable to fashion and smart watches for more seasoned marketers. A watch that costs a few hundred bucks with a quartz movement that's not serviceable and frankly isn't a Balm and Mercier. It's a sort of half breed. That's just the wrong watch for the moment, and it's exactly the kind of Swiss watch that has been eaten up by the Apple Watch in recent years. The wrong product at the wrong time. I think entry-level luxury needs to be exactly that. Entry-level, but luxury. This, given its price range and marketing, really isn't. And it confuses people. Is it Balm and Mercier? No, but they have to keep explaining that. Okay, Breitling Navitimer 8. The whole line... It's not that they didn't look like the classic Navitimer. Some people object to that. I don't have a problem with it. Historically, there have been a lot of Navitimers that look nothing like the circular slide ruled model we know. The problem is that, and, and that's perfectly excusable if the models are sensational. They don't have to look like classical Navitimers. It's that these felt calculated to offend no one, but neither did they really thrill. Nobody in New York, when I went to the US debut, seemed to react with the breathless, gotta-have-it excitement that marks a hit, and Breitling can't put that genie back in the bottle for a do-over. New management gets only one first impression, and this was the choice. Again, sound watches, but they didn't need sound watches. They needed screaming sound barrier breakers roaring onto the market with 
vision, vitality, and energy. I didn't sense a whole lot of energy, collector or journalist, behind this new line. That said, I remain open-minded. I think Breitling's best for this year is actually going to come in the tail end around the fall season, so stay tuned. Okay, I sensed no passion, but I'm going to give them a mulligan. There's still the rest of 2018 to date. So here's where the industry fell short. Beyond the obvious ones, Baum and Mercier Clifton Club Indian Burt Monroe Tribute. This is a very unusual looking watch, and it is a very idiosyncratic watch. When you have a product that's this quirky, you need a first class marketing effort to educate and explain to your customer base why they want this and why it's cool, because it does not translate without a backstory. And I don't feel like Baum and Mercier did that. So they need a compelling story to make sense of the watch and inspire customers to buy. But when was the last time you had any direct social media or word of mouth contact with Baum and Mercier? For the most part, I think all of our answer is going to be never or not recently. The Baumatic chronometer was epic with its five day movement. That was very cool. This I sense a misfire. Okay, FP Journe Mono Pusher Rattrapant. Now, the movement alone, the FP Journe Mono Pusher Rattrapant, part of the line sports series, the movement alone was worth the price of admission. And with a date and conventional chronograph registers, this is a more usable chronograph than the Santograph. It's the usable FP Journe chronograph that has been missing in action since the Octachrono bowed out in 2007. But if we keep that image up, the proportions of the bezel, the lugs, and the case look a little bit off. There's a Generation 1 Rolex Deep Sea thing going on here that I don't absolutely adore. Moreover, I think the strongest model was the Platinum one, which is also going to be the least common. So I'm going to reserve my judgment until I have one in the studio for review. But so far, I'm kind of detecting a little bit of a rare misfire by F.P. Journ here. Now, the thing might prove me wrong. It might gain a lot of momentum down the line, but I'm sensing it's going to be the next Octa Divine, the one that never quite finds a constituency. Zenith at Basel World 2018. A bit of a misfire here. The energy of the DeFi El Primero 21 and the DeFi Lab of the previous 12 months was largely missing at Zenith's Basel World rollouts, and I expected more. They seem to have an iron in many fires right now without being able to decide on any one thrust, and you do need messaging coherence to market luxury, especially niche luxury like Zenith. So, Innovation seems to come in all or nothing spurts with Zenith right now, and I didn't sense it at Basel. Yes, the new gimbaled tourbillon, or I should say gimbaled escapement because it's not a tourbillon, was kind of cool. This DeFi is 0G, but it's not a mainstream product, and it's not going to get the rank and file collectors riled up and excited. So right now, Zenith is doing different styles, different sizes, the Bamford customization, the bringing in tech from Tag Heuer with the DeFi El Primero 21, high tech you know, with the DeFi lab, but they're not serializing it yet. It's not ready for prime time. They've made 10 of them. There's the Swiss Beats line, which I think is just wrong for the image of the Zenith brand, alienating the connoisseurs and the traditionalists without really bringing in a new constituency. And Hublot and Tag Heuer design style makes it harder to tell the mid-priced Zenith brand away, apart from the upper crust Hublot brand, which could help, but also apart from the lower priced Tag brand, which can hurt. Brand identity and innovation kind of stalled at Zenith right now, and I didn't sense any help from the Basel World collections, which just kind of moved pieces around the plate like a kid who doesn't want to eat his dinner. Okay, and finally, no humor. The Moser Swiss Icons watch was an obvious joke. It was an obvious joke. This was not supposed to be taken literally. The problem is the backlash was as predictable as it was pathetic. Insecurity and a total incapacity for self-deprecating irony led to tension where none needed to exist. Everyone should have gotten a chuckle out of this. Uh, there should have been more of a tendency to take this in stride by blue chip powers with nothing to fear and no reputations at stake, and unfortunately, that's not what happened. There was a lot of ill will and bad blood, and frankly, everyone should have just laughed and gone on with their business. This was a misfire, but not by Moser. Moser, you guys are still tops. Swiss watch industry, grow a sense of humor. Okay, finally, this would almost be a misfire, but they admitted their mistake. Audemars Piguet, all Royal Oaks for the year. 
Not a problem because AP announced right up front during their press conference at SIHH, this year is about the Royal Oak. Next year, the Jules Audemars line is either gone or completely redesigned. We know that needs to be addressed. So they know there's a problem. I'm not going to ding them for it. Let them have one more good year with the Royal Oaks, but you really do have to round out the catalog AP, and we're going to revisit this in a moment. All right, Re wrist shots. Here we go. Bell Y rolls out his Patek Philippe 5146J. So Bell Y with his annual calendar rocking it in yellow gold at the wheel. Kenny J crosses the German Swiss border with his Langa 1815 up down. Impeccable taste, my man. And then he doubles back across the border with his Patek Philippe 5296 sector dial, a connoisseur after my own heart in both cases. Simon H covers land, sea, and air with his Beechcraft. Beechcraft Bonanza, and his Rolex Sea Dweller. Rocking it, land, sea, and sky. I love it. Guys, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Send me your wrist chats to see your pieces on these pixels. All right. Primary feature tonight, guys. I can see Captain Zed first saying, I agree on Zenith. And I can see Eddie Landsberg saying, Facebook sound is fixed, but 15 seconds behind. Do they have a delay on me that I don't know about? Am I getting that risque? <laughs> Nothing about the Breitling or the Moser got through. That's, that's the joke on me. Okay, first things first, guys. We all understand that talk has runneth over about a longa sports watch, not just the year, this year, but really for the last decade. Now, I'm told that a longa sports watch is inevitable. The question becomes, how badly does Longa need it, and what form should it take if it arrives? And should there be more than one, or should there be a sportification of existing Longa references? Let's hit all of that. First, sports watches. In the Haute de Gamme segment, Audemars, Patek, and VC all do this, and it's driving volumes like nothing else they offer at the moment. This is really the cash cow for a watch industry that has seen a very irregular recovery between brands, but even between individual model families offered by the brands. How important are the sports watches to these big three? Well, consider this. Where would AP be right now with only the Jules Audemars line and complications? Tell me which one of those watches is a hot button piece right now. Go ahead, take your time. And where would they be if they only had this and the millinery. Again, tell me which one of these is waitlisted to infinity at your dealer. Well, I, I can tell you where they would be. They'd be pretty much where Longa is right now. AP dress watches are as uncool as the Royal Oaks and Offshores are cool and hot. There's no brand equity in any other AP model line, so that's Audemars. Okay, Patek is the same. I will also say before I go there, guys, let's double back. On the basis of dress watches alone, Lanka's SIHH offerings of all dress watches were way better than anything AP offers. From the triple split to various Grand Date models to the sensational copper blue Saxonia Thin. These were great watches. Audemars should have these under the Jules Audemars banner, but they don't. So as far as dress watches are concerned, for 2018, Longa, you rocked. So let's go back to Paddock now. Paddock is the same as Audemars Piguet. So Paddock is truly the same. Consider this, guys. How many of these model lines have people beating down the door to get on wait lists? Uh, this many. That's how many. There. I answered the question for you. Patek with only gold Calatravas, Grand Complications, Gondolo, and Ellipse is literally nowhere. It's a decimated force. And Vacheron's emphasis, I should mention, on dress watches draws it rather close to Langa in performance. It's no coincidence. You see what happens when these brands de-emphasize sports watches. Vacheron does have the overseas, but in terms of offerings, it's mostly dress watches, which means of the Swiss Big Three, it's the closest in offerings to Langa, and it's also the one that is suffering the most among AP, VC, and Paddock. Is there a coincidence there? Now, Langa is often compared to these Big Three of Swiss high horology, and I agree with that. I would actually put them no worse than co-equal number one. But here's the thing. Longa needs a sports watch, and we all agree on that. Dissidents, sound off in the chat box. 
Okay, does a longer sports watch, second question, undermine the brand or its image or deviate unduly from its heritage? No, and here's the thing. They've made sports watches before. Historical aviators watches, remember Longa, and here's an example, was one of the original producers of the BR for the Luftwaffe. Now, post-1940s, Longa doesn't have much of a sporting watch heritage, but then, then again, after communist collectivization, there wasn't much of a Longa for a couple of decades. So they can realistically say at one point we had sports watches in our catalog and we made good ones. I will also say no because Lanka's identity isn't necessarily built on dress watches, but rather the notion of innovation across many models, instrument-like precisions, and Teutonic character. All of those are coincident and compatible with a sports watch. Moreover, aviation watches have been done to death. So though Longa has this in its back catalog, this should not be the inspiration. And Glasuta Original, which is the true historical successor to the original Alanga Unzona, already made the Navigators back in the late 2000s. Great watches, but the modern Longa does not need to revisit this because it's already been done across town by Gio and, frankly, everyone else in the world. Okay, so... What would a longa sports watch look like and what would it do and what segment would it be in? Here's where things get really interesting. It should be an ultra thin dive watch. Go ahead, guys. I know some of you guys have encyclopedic memories of watches and you are huge fans of the dive class because you always tell me so. How many sub 10 millimeter thick dive watches can you think of off the top of your head? How many sub eight? I can't think of one. And I've seen it all. So this is clearly a vacant space, just begging someone with the technical capability, the credibility, and a sense of innovation and disruptive design to move in, and that sounds like Longa. Think about this. No one's doing an ultra-thin diver. It would be consistent with Longa's brand ethic of engineering and elegance, and it would still be able to double as a formal watch when necessary. AP's Royal Oak Offshore Diver is a monster. So is Blancpain's 50 Fathoms. Even the small one at 40 millimeters is way thick. And it's important to remember that Vacheron and Paddock have no divers. There's an opening that no one is looking at right now. Longa, it's double wide and waiting for you to sail your ship right through. The AP-15202 and Patek Fleet 5711 are both 8.3 millimeters thick. You beat that with a diver, and then you've really got something. Something very special and very different. And you could ask big money and put people on a wait list to get it. So let's talk about what it should include. Okay, make it a micro-rotor auto with a display case back because you're longa and duh. It has to be automatic, and because it has to be thin, it's got to be a micro-rotor. Longa, you already have experience with the Saxomat making a micro-rotor. Keep the panorama datum. It's a signature of the brand. It needs to be there. Find a way to make it work. Make it 40 to 42 millimeters so it remains versatile. It shouldn't be thin and petite, nor should it be excessively broad because there are proportion issues that could be a bit off-putting. See FP Journe Mono Pusher Ratropon. It also allows it to compare favorably to the Nautilus and to the Royal Oak Jumbo without alienating Far Eastern customers and more traditionalist Western buyers who tend to be into Langa. So use the Lumen Tech. Now, this is where I need a picture to illustrate it. Guys, not luminous, but lumen. This is what a full luminescent disc longa looks like. This technology needs to make it into the longa sports watch. This would help to make it further differentiated from the rest of what's out there. And this is already a secret signature of the longa manufacturer. It needs to be in the sports watch. Okay, let's talk volume. We believe at least based on my input, that it should be an ultra-thin diver, that it should have lumen tech, that it should be automatic, that it should be relatively compact, and that it should have a distinctive elegance compatible with two-way use. But how many should they make? Well, Lanka only makes 5,000 watches a year, and at 5,000, they've already oversupplied the market. So if anything, they need to peg back production. This thing needs to start scarce. Let's start with 100 pieces. Let's break the internet with publicity. Let's do the kind of messaging via social media and word of mouth that, frankly, Longa can actually do decently, unlike Baum and Mercier. And let's make it so scarce that the wait list stretches out to a year. And let's do that for two years. 
Let's keep the buzz around this thing strong. Now, here's the other thing. Ultimately, it should be no more than 5% of Longa's production. If Patek makes 20% of its watches in steel, most of those are the Ladies 24, Patek's single best-selling model. That's most of Patek's steel production. It's hard to imagine that either the Nautilus or the Aquanaut comprises more than 5% of Patek's total production. Let's use that as our guide. So Longa figure at peak no more than about 250 of these a year in titanium. Why titanium? Because no one else offers their standard haute de gamme sports watch in tie in the big three class. VC, Paddock, Audemars Piguet, the standard model, the jumbo for each one is not a titanium watch. You need to make it titanium to set it apart. And it's important to remember that you need to protect the heritage of steel longa, which is always rare. Those are exquisite auction highlights when they show up. Don't dilute that tradition. Maintain it. So ultimately, you need to make sure that you're looking at 5 to 10 percent of your total production once you add precious metal options. And to raise margins, you should be able to get the watch in rose gold, in platinum, in yellow. But all told, titanium and precious metal, keep it under 10 percent. Titanium, 5 percent. Finally, Offer a rotating collection of existing Longa movements in a special sports-specific case. Call it a Longa sports mode, whatever you want to call it. But like F.P. Journe with the line sport, have existing models ported over to the sports line so you have a rotating offering every two years, like the Port Pour Le Merite or the Handwerks Kunst series or the Lumen series. Make it something you do every two or three model years. 100 to 200 pieces only, and it allows you to spread out some of your models across the sports portfolio so you're not too mono, but you don't dilute. Think of F.P. Journe's Line Sports series. Consider the difference between a Santagraph and a Santagraph Sport. Now consider doing this with the Zeitwerk, with the Triple Split, with the Longa One. This would be truly special. This would be a buzz watch that people would get on a wait list to buy. And just like F.P. Journe created a standardized case for the line sport, let there be a standardized case for these. So visually they're coherent and they're all aquatic watches, minimum 100 meter water resistance, and make these in steel. Make them rare, make them occasional, make these the successor to the old Longa One Steel Series from 1998 rare and occasional. That's the kind of excitement and exclusivity that inspires clients to get on a wait list, sight on see, unseen. Also, leverage exclusivity, unique design, and unique capability to sell these watches at list price longer. Ultimately, the commercial impact of the Longa sports offerings will go far beyond these models. It's just as important to remember that the sports watch would have the cachet to sell at list, drive sales of dress models at list when people are in buying the sports watch, and the commercial impact will go beyond. Consider watches selling at list resell more strongly on secondary markets. Watches selling at list improve profit margins for the brand when selling new, and watches selling at list improve perception of the brand across the board. So Longa. Use the Line Sport series like F.P. Journe does to move popular movements into sporting cases and then have a dedicated ultra-thin diver, something only Longa can do, and indeed, something only Longa will be doing if it comes to that. Okay, best article of the week. Link in the description field below, guys, but experience visiting the Audemars Piguet manufacturer in Le Brassou. A long-time dream becomes a reality by Halim Trujillo, proprietor at WatchCollectingLifestyle.com. I like to shout out the best article written by a watch journalist each week. Technically, this published on June 23rd. Didn't make the cut for this week, but we're including it because it's the first installment of a series, and it's awesome. First, epic macros of watches and movements are included. Here's an example. You're gonna enjoy this as a feast for the eyes. Lifestyle shots also included and written with narrative that illuminates the atmosphere and activities of Audemars Piguet's headquarters at Le Brassou. You can see the historic original building just behind with its mansard roof, an icon. The site needs to be on your bookmark list. It's a lot of fun. It has everything from hardcore product showcases that share space with travel notes, interviews, and industry commentary. Good site. Focus on this article for now. 
Halim's site lives up to its billing as a showcase of watch collecting lifestyle and not simply an Instagram feed with words like many others who cover product to the exclusion of almost all else. Halim being a noted gourmand, there is plenty of food imagery in this one too. To satisfy those appetites, beautifully composed of course, and Senor Trujillo really shows off his skills as the best travel writer among the press corps of journalists who cover the watch space for a living. He gives you the best sense of being there and living it. His account of this pilgrimage comes from the heart as he is a 20-year collector and enthusiast of Audemars Piguet, and the excitement is palpable. Add context, critical perspective, and plenty of focus for those of us who are mostly, frankly, in it for the watches, and you have the best article for the week. Stay tuned to WatchClickingLifestyle.com for future installments of this visit series. Finally, viewer wrist shots closing out. Edward L. from sunny Sweden shares his Swatch System 51 poolside. Franklin C. of Brooklyn sends our first ever car video capture with his Rolex Datejust 41 two-tone with diamond dial. He's watching me on his infotainment system. That is a first. Mark O. appears to be flying high with his Ulysse Nardin dual time. I sense cockpit imagery in the backdrop there. Fly safe, my good man. And Philip H. turns back the clock and the watch with his vintage Hoyer Bund 3H dial. Tritium in the best possible package. All right, guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Comment and subscribe in the description below. And remember, even if I didn't read out your responses, I read them all after the broadcast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tim. They're the crew. This is Watches Tonight from Watchbox Studios. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.